You're listening to All Things Video, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the past and charting the future of the online video ecosystem. You're listening to All Things Video. I'm your host, James Creech, and today's guest is Steve Gottlieb, founder and CEO of Shindig. Hey, Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, James. Yeah, thanks for being here. And I'm excited. This is, uh, we had a chance to meet on Shindig a couple of weeks ago. And here we are, you know, broadcasting today through the Shindig platform. So for, for those who aren't familiar, take us back in time. What was the original inspiration behind Shindig? Well, so, uh, um, you know, my original background was the music business. I had run a record company for 25 years. Uh, and uh, I had sold that. And I was looking around online uh, uh, and I was just struck by how uh, virtual events, they didn't, weren't really called them back then, but how virtual, uh, uh, how empty the online world was and how it seemed to be stuck in a secret text with chat rooms and whatnot. And it never video chat had never really come into its own. It was great for one-on-ones, but large-scale experiences didn't exist online, uh, except in these text chat rooms. And that really puzzled me. Um, And so I began a deep investigation um, into into that, and, and I spoke to a lot of the big providers at that point in time, like uh, who, Adobe and, and what have you. And they, the way they explained it is, oh my God, you know, it's a big secret. All we're really providing, we're no, we don't even provide video conferencing uh, because everyone has their cameras turned off. We're just providing old school teleconferencing uh, for a lot of our clients. Uh, and that really highlighted for me that, that um, a light bulb went off that, in fact, a lot of what was being offered was just that, the same architecture of the telephone, which, if you think about it, no one has ever been on a great large-scale audio conference call with 500 people. So why would anybody be surprised that a large-scale video conference would suddenly magically be better? Um uh, and that was the big aha moment. Hey, there's something wrong here. The telephone conference was a compromise. It worked, uh, conference calls worked great with five, six, seven, maybe 10 people. But the minute you got to scale, it doesn't it work. Practical. <laughs> yeah. and whether it's an audio conference or a video conference, uh, it's just not working. Yeah, time to fundamentally rethink the whole model. Very cool. Well, Steve, I want to spend a little bit more time on your background in the music business. So you, as you mentioned, spent 25 years in the music industry. You were the founder of TVT Records. Uh, you know, share some of your stories or experiences from music and then how you made the transition into the technology and, and online video, online, you know, uh, virtual events. Well, it's interesting. You know, I entered the music field. You know, I was a lawyer before that or went had gone to law school. Uh, and my first record... Uh, when I started my company, was a compilation of old TV themes, hmm. uh, television's greatest hits, which became actually a big worldwide hit. Um, I, I looked at the music industry and I saw big opportunities, uh, precisely because I noted, you know, very strategically that the big companies had diseconomies of scale as much as they had economies of scale, and that inefficiency, I thought, an independent label could really solve. So we built TVT around the notion of building brands from the grassroots. You know, the major labels control top 40 radio, but my success with television's greatest hits showed that, hey, if you build really passionate fan bases, that you could end run the major labels and create an equal or more profound kind of success. And that style of marketing It actually also informs the whole philosophy behind Shindig. Mm -hmm. You know, what connected my success in music, uh, breaking Nine Inch Nails and Pitbull and Little John and Ja Rule and all these artists who were very much kind of in left field when they began, was that ability to connect 
super fans and create evangelical movements uh, uh, of people who really felt acknowledged and recognized by artists so that they really wanted to be passionate, to share their passions. And Shindig was built with that same philosophy. If you want to build audience, uh, build evangel evangelism, build, uh, accentuate the passion of your community uh, so that they help you grow, allowing them to participate, allowing them to feel that they're getting some premium experience is critical. Yeah. So what you think is all about creating premium experience. And that's something unique that the internet has enabled, right? I mean, 30 years ago, if you wanted to identify super fans of, you know, an emerging music artist or a genre that maybe wasn't as popular or carried in the top 40, it's hard to do that, right? But now with the dawn of social media and the internet, people can connect and share their love for this, you know, new artist or this new music style in a way that they couldn't before. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, it has, you know, a, a, as a lover of great music, it has uh, been both a blessing and a curse in the sense it has put much more responsibility on artists, but it's also given them a lot more power. Mm -hmm. So that's a double-edged sword. Now they are responsible really in large measure for breaking themselves, for creating that all-important initial fan base and the major labels just step in as a bank to uh, necessarily amplify that. Mm -hmm. But the, the hardest part of starting any movement, whether you're a, a band or a brand, is your initial audience of connecting mm -hmm. with that initial target audience that's going to uh, uh, be the uh, be the leading edge. Yeah. So I'm curious to get your take on what do you see as the forces that have been driving that change, right? There's a few things that jump out to me. One being, you know, the evolution of how music monetizes. It went from largely physical distribution to obviously streaming and you've got uh, live events or touring, which has been decimated over the past 12 months. But now we're seeing this really dramatic resurgence, which is exciting. So that's kind of maybe element one. The second piece is you've got um, this, the, the uh, creation of social media platforms where you can discover a Justin Bieber, right, on, on YouTube. And you disintermediated the gatekeepers. So it's not just about big labels breaking artists anymore. Someone can blow up on TikTok and become kind of an overnight success. Are these things starting to converge? And, and now we're seeing that the, the artists have more power than they had in the past. It's something that comes to mind is like, you know, Taylor Swift versus Big Machine and Scooter Braun, like they're reclaiming more of the power for themselves because they share that direct connection with their audience now? Yes, I mean, obviously we, we, we are all, you know, want control of our destinies and we all resent, you know, uh, the exercise of the uh, power that interferes with our uh, autonomy. Um, so, um, and to a certain extent, resent that gatekeepers who are not adding value uh, are uh, have that control and also have part of the reward that they may not be justified by virtue of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of how whatever uh, ap uh, uh, aspect of society has given them that privileged position. Mm -hmm. So um, that is definitely uh, an unstoppable movement. And even though the major labels uh, have never been more powerful, you know, in some ways never been more powerful, more successful uh, than they've ever been, uh, they're, they do, do so in a different context. Um, uh, uh, and for the artist who wants to have ultimate control, they can, they can make that choice. Uh, and and assume the consequences. You know, there, it doesn't mean that there is not an art and a value to being great marketers and execute excellent uh, executors of strategy and implementers of, of marketing uh, schema. Uh, uh, so there are certainly rewards to that, and there are rewards that go with providing the capital. Um, and but. Uh, um, 
you know, it allows people now who are in, in the creative fields to have a lot more choice and allows the marketplace to enjoy a lot more options. Very cool. Uh, so, uh, and to make the segue, I like to think that Shindig is part of the movement to doing the same thing with anyone who is reliant on building audience and communicating effectively with a large group. Yeah. Uh, uh, because what, what Shindig is, uh, is, is all about, unlike the older platforms that repressed user autonomy, tried to treat people like cattle, uh, you know, God forbid they should be able to take the stage and ask a question. They should be good sheep and just listen to our message and, and text in their comments. Uh, and we're the only ones who are entitled to have a voice. Shindig is more about giving more respect to the audience. Very cool. So I'm curious, have you always considered yourself an entrepreneur? Yeah, you know, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. My father uh, growing up had started, you know, four or five different businesses until uh, one day he came home with a bunch of inflatable bottles. Hmm. Uh, and this was around the time of Andy Warhol and uh, uh, started a company that was called Two Plus Three because it was the parents and three kids built around pop art replicas. Hmm. Uh, and so I grew up in that business going to trade shows and, and uh uh, blowing up the pillows, uh, blowing up uh, uh, the bottles at the trade shows, and uh, um, um, uh, um, and it was that confidence in some of the uh, 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 all the different mundane elements of business, uh, from working in the warehouse and doing packing and shipping, and to issuing invoices and trade shows and all the rest. That finally, when I came up with the idea for television's greatest hits and uh, decided to distribute it myself direct to retailers, I had that confidence. And, you know, I think being an entrepreneur is, um, is about having, you know, a great deal of curiosity in every aspect of the process uh, of, of meeting uh, an end user or consumer's need and, and, and um, liking the idea of having, you know, challenges all over the place, uh, not wanting to choose the problems you solve, but actually enjoying the fact that every day you face a new problem that you never anticipated. Yeah. So you had an, an early example, right? And your father and <clears throat> kind of growing up maybe with entrepreneurship in your blood. But and anyway. well, importantly, it was two plus three. So it was my mm -hmm. mother who, uh, who after my father passed away has run the show Amazing, uh, uh, and the company, uh, uh, you know, a year or two ago celebrated its 50th anniversary. Wow! Uh, yeah. Under her leadership, so she's been, she has been an amazing inspiration as a very successful uh, uh, role model. Very cool. What did you find was the hardest part for you being a first-time founder when you set out and launched TVT? Um. Well, we were going out of business every day for uh, several years. I, I think. 25 years in, we had 25 years of growth. And even though we had growth every year, I thought we were always, you know, going out of business. You know, uh, even when we had, no matter how many platinum records, uh, there's a certain thing about being in the hot seat uh, um, of being an entrepreneur that you never, you never allow yourself to be comfortable. You know, as Andy Grove said, you know, the paranoid, you know, his comment about the paranoid survive. And, uh, That's right. Feed or whatnot. Uh, 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 I think that's uh, that notion is is critical. Uh, you know, and, and you know, it depends. You know, we we romanticize entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, all businesses. You know, uh, business people are entrepreneurs, and all individuals are entrepreneurs. It really depends how much. You know, what we really are romanticizing is the desire to push the limits whether it's in your personal career or in your business, and to deal with that discomfort of, of uncertainty. Um, and I think that's what, you know, whether you're a fortune, you know, whether you're a big company or a small company, whether you're a startup or, 
or a company that oh, due to COVID has to completely pivot. Uh, it's your resilience and ability to deal with uh, 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 problems uh, and problem solve and, and, and be comfortable with that, that, that counts. Uh, yeah. And your grit in, in you know, fighting, fighting for what you believe in. Yeah. You know, entrepreneurship is a French word, but uh, there's something distinctly American about this notion of kind of unbridled capitalism combined with pure individualism and kind of self-reliance, right? That that we we do romanticize this ideal of uh, the rebel, right? Kind of the lone founder who sets out to change the course of an industry and starts a business for better or for worse, right? I mean, I think there are elements of that mythology that are powerful and, and really inspiring to people, but we, you know, there's a lot of um, survivorship bias and we overlook the failures and everything else and the, the mistakes or the, the transgressions that some of these quote unquote heroic figures uh, take, right? It's, it's easy to mythologize Steve Jobs as this like great example of an entrepreneur because he's been so successful and created this phenomenal business. And at the same time, we uh, victimize like Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who had she succeeded, maybe we would have celebrated her, right? And overlooked some of these horrible things that she did. So it's really interesting kind of that, that uh, this, this notion that we celebrate as entrepreneurship in the US, I think. Well, you know, uh, um, you know I don't know whether this is an interesting thought. My favorite person in the music business, uh, uh, a very renowned, uh, producer and, and uh, label founder um, once made a comment to me that he thought, you know, the biggest artists always are talking about love. You know, the dissident artists who really uh, may have initial success focusing on alienation, eventually their biggest hits and in the fullness of their career, come around to uh, focusing on connecting us hmm. and to love. Interesting. Um, I think that's true of entrepreneurship. Uh, I don't think that, I think there may be a very selfish and self-serving uh, notion of, uh, of individualism in certain areas of capitalism that may inspire, you know, greed may inspire uh, a lot of entrepreneurship, but I think an equal amount uh, or the greater amount is inspired by the notion of, hey, if I do good, if I provide a benefit that people value, I will then be successful and be rewarded for it. And really put um, that first as opposed to second serving a community, a constituency, a client base, and uh, serving their needs, you know, will produce the value equation that uh, uh, rewards me. Um, um, that's certainly what motivates me. <clears throat> I didn't start and I don't go to work every day with Shindig with the notion of improving my bank account. It is all about Changing. There are a lot, a lot yeah. better ways to get rich. And I always tell people that, right? My, the folks that I mentor, the students that I work with, you know, entrepreneurship, as much as it's glamorized, is not always the path to riches. Well, you know, going with what you're saying about focusing on the failures, you know, you can't tolerate those failures if your motivation was your pocketbook. Uh, if your motivation was something else, you know, uh, uh, you made that bargain and you're okay with the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the lessons that you learned from your earlier experience that you're now applying in Shindig? What are the mistakes that you made at TBT Records that, you know, you said, I'm going to do it different, right? This this next go around. Well, I was super stubborn. Um, that is what defending an artist's position, that's what I see as the role of the record company. I regard it as the majors as super fickle. They put out a single doesn't get added to radio, on to the next artist. That's the way they treated their business. They had a huge portfolio of potential artists and just on to the next, keep trying, 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 and yep. get one that works. Yep. Um, I took the opposite, a small, a small group of artists, but develop, you know, brands and, and, and things that were gonna be evergreen by really identifying artists I really believed in 
and then go out single after single after single until I moved the market, until I connected them with that audience that was going to create that grassroots fire. And so Nine Inch Nails didn't happen on the first single. Uh, we didn't get added to MTV. We didn't get added to the radio. It took a long time. Pitbull was six, seven singles in before their record went, his first record went gold. Uh, the same thing with Little John, the same thing with Ja Rule, the same thing with all these things. I was super stubborn mm -hmm. and saying, if I found that kernel, if I got that positive response, then I knew I could get it. I could blow it up. Mm -hmm. I just had to find the path and give it the time in the marketplace. Shindig was years ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked at, okay, video is out there. Large scale events have to happen. The reality is up until the pandemic, people didn't know what a virtual event was. They thought it was, there's no difference between a virtual event and a video conference. Uh, they had never been to what a virtual event where you really want to interact in lots of different ways and be engaging. And, yeah. and then um, all of a sudden you're forced to, right? Here's the new reality and you were a decade ahead of the curve, huh? But quite honestly, um, it's very difficult. You know, a lot of great entrepreneurs die on the vine because their, their timing isn't right. And so much is up to timing. I don't know where we would be without the pandemic, for example. You know, the reality is the marketplace has been happy with the webinar, has been happy with uh, um, with live streaming and emojis coming back uh, on, uh, on Instagram or whatnot. And that may serve a lot of the marketplace. You know, they're happy on Twitch just to put in text comments and not being able to ask a gamer a question in video uh, and or talk to their friends while they're wa watching the talk. So. A lot of that is okay, uh, it, you know, and, uh, you know, the kind of deep, robust engagement, you know, we'll see if we can create that fire now uh, post, post pandemic. I see it changing, right? I mean, fundamentally, you had traditional media, think of radio, television, film, where, you know, it was one to many, uh, gatekeeper control distributed from the, the top down. Then you had the advent of social media 1.0, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram where it's still a broadcast function, right? I'm creating a video, I upload it to my YouTube channel, I send it out to my subscribers, similar kind of uh, idea or philosophy on, on Facebook, t Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. But now we've got this movement towards more participatory uh, entertainment, right? You've got Discord, you've got Clubhouse, right? You've got this, this uh, community-based kind of niche super fandom happening on the internet and kind of the social media 2.0 phenomenon where I don't need to reach a hundred million, a billion people. If I can reach 10,000 of the people who share my interest in this band or, you know, this political view or something else, let's have a participatory conversation through a platform like Shindig, right? I think that's where we're headed. Well, James, it goes beyond that. You know, I think you are a thousand percent that <clears throat> what's going on, you know, Clubhouse is the tip of the iceberg. But for me, one of the, you know, but I don't think it's limited to smaller communities. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, you ask Howard Stern, you ask um, <clears throat> uh, uh, any of the great sports commentators, having an audience member as a foil, riding on their energy, riding on their question, it makes for great entertainment. It makes better content mm -hmm. than a one-way communication. So bringing in audience members and engaging them is in itself. Look, that's what talk radio is about. In a certain way, elevating normal people to stars is a lot of what reality TV is about. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the big moments in my mind for how participatory media could compete was that great application, uh, trivia, uh, what was it called, Tri a HQ Trivia. HQ, yeah, yeah. Which competed on, on Oscar night and got three million people to turn away from the Oscars to log into HQ Trivia wow. on their phones, which shows that wasn't video chat participation. 
But if you, you know, that the fact that you could get people that you don't need television, you could get people on their devices and collect them together for an experience, you know, uh, in this new age, it was really just a question of the creativity of the producer and uh, the way they involved their audience. And I think the fact that Hollywood or and other parts of the entertainment sector, the traditional book, music, film, TV production houses have not s seen that and not seen that there is a possibility for a whole new medium of participatory entertainment. You know, I, you know, that's what's coming. It's going to be, you know. So is this format the future of stand-up comedy and Coachella and the State of the Union address? Or what are the things that you think are going to become these participatory environments? Well, no, they're going to be unique. It's not going to be, you know, but will Coachella have a backstage mm -hmm. that uh, can go, that people in, even in the live audience on their phone can have a, pro can ask the, the, uh, uh, the performers before they go on stage about their set list or, uh -huh. or what have you, uh -huh. that, they, that it won't be backstage for just, you know, a hundred people, but, you know, 10,000 people will have, be able to have a backstage experience. Cool. Or uh, will they have a pre-show, uh, a pre-online event for Coachella and a post-show event? Will the Coachella community be able to be 52 weeks a year outside of the uh, the live show mm -hmm. and be developed kind of be part of a, a regular community that maybe shares passions and discovers music uh, together and builds friendships. You know, there are going to be a whole range of different things. Yeah, there was a, new, uh, new experiences. Yeah, uh, and it's those. Some of them will be add-ons to uh, physical events, like you point. You know, pre-shows, post-shows, and regular communities. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to be their own kind of entertainment. And I, what I was speaking to before, you know, Scott Rogowski, if you're out there, you want to start your own uh, trivia show tomorrow and have contestants uh, come up and, and uh, uh, on the press of a buzzer and get a chance to answer. Here we go. Awesome. This is the future of Jeopardy right here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you mentioned the pandemic, right? Obviously, the last 14 months have fundamentally changed virtual events and the way we interact. Uh, and particularly in music, right? You know, all these performers who couldn't go on stage, couldn't travel, couldn't tour. Uh, how does, you know, how is this experience creating these new entertainment experiences and how will music adapt and evolve as a result? Well, I think it was a big tragedy that, uh, look, but the tragedy, which I don't think anyone gives sufficient attention to is the pandemic. I don't think... Uh, we breeze over the pandemic and 600,000 American lives lost and uh, 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 the cost around the world. And we breeze over it and we're all excited about getting back. I don't think anyone has done enough uh, to reach out to those personally impacted uh, uh, by the tragedy. And I don't mean to uh, uh, talk of it in this context without uh, saying how uh, sad I am for for all those who who uh, suffered and mm -hmm. lost loved ones or had dramatic impacts to their their livelihoods. Um, and continue to right. I mean, we're turning the corner in the U.S., but it rages on in India and you know other parts of the world. So, uh, but that said, uh, for uh, the future and your question, your question, or, or uh, you know, I think it was a shame the labels, music labels. Uh, uh, deserted the artists and deserted the fans. They left the artists up to themselves to navigate the pandemic. And okay, you know, it was great. Some of them, dis uh, you know, uh, it was great that DJ Nice discovered uh, 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 Instagram and it was great this one discovered this platform and, and this one figured out how to do this, but they were all left to their own devices. Uh, and most of them, uh, uh, you know, did not do well and didn't figure it out and it would have and it is uh i think the 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 major labels did a, a, a horrible job they could they could they could have seized the moment and created platforms for their artists to engage fans 
and do it profitably. And instead, they all stuck their head in the sands and said, the same way they did with MP3s and with streaming services, we don't, we don't know tech, that's, we don't know consumers, we don't know how to do that. You know, we just own rights and do marketing. Um, and I think it was a disgrace. Yep, that's not, an, it shouldn't be an excuse anymore. Um, I think music artists still are in the woods with technology. Mm -hmm. They have a huge opportunity to create experiences. We look to artists not just for their music, but we look at them as defining our peeps. The kind They define the people who share our taste, and we like people who share our taste, who like our aesthetic. So they themselves are the, are the connector of communities. And... It's more than just their music. They, they have a brand and they have something to say that they do just by creating a venue for their fans to connect within and amplify that kind of unspoken aesthetic that, that kind of informs your way of relating to the world and your lifestyle and your shared memories and your collective kind of gestalt kind of attitudes. And I think uh, right now they monetize their ability for access. Uh, most of it they give away um, in exchange for thinking they're going to monetize it by promoting their, their uh, whatever they're selling. The rest of it they monetize through backstage passes, which is a very exclusive business only going to the people with the, you know, to the, the wealthy. Um, they could monetize that access online at five bucks, ten bucks, or uh, get it, sell it to advertisers and continue mm -hmm. to do it for free. Um, and um, it's a shame they're not utilizing a tech like Shindig to create that kind of regular fan experience, whether it's their album release parties or listening parties or, or what have you. Uh, so that will come. Yeah. So you made the transformation, right, from a music guy to a tech guy, right? How was that transition for you? Painful, and it's still painful. <laughs> uh, look, I got gray hair. I'm not in the demo. You know, I'm no different than anyone else. Learning tech, learn, learning a new app, learning something else, you know, uh, um, it's, uh, you know, I wish I were 20-something and this all came native and, and uh uh, I could code just like because uh, I grew up coding, you yeah. know, and uh, all the rest, um, you know. But uh, when tech allows us to achieve things, frees us, enables us in new ways, and gives us new experiences, that it's worth the struggle. So yeah, that's uh, what I tell myself every day. So look, uh, labels and music artists out there and everyone else, if, if Steve can do it, you can do it, right? <laughs> hey, most artists are so far ahead of me. I mean, most, look, they know tech. They may not have figured out the marketing challenges of how to do uh, online events, but, you know, the, you know musicians, uh, 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 you know, music tech uh, has been one of the leading, and production tech has been one of the leading uh, 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 drivers of technology for 40 years. Yeah. Now, Steve, what's coming next? If you had to make three predictions for the future of the digital media ecosystem, what would they be? Well, I think um, participate. Well, I'll put, wrap it up in one thing. Uh, when text was, when the printed book was dethroned, when the printed magazine was uh, thrown away. When we recognize that sharing text could be done more efficiently online than in any physical embodiment, the world of text communication radically changed. And all of a sudden you had everything from Twitter to Wikipedia. You had 140 to limitless content and everything being shared. It didn't hurt the printed book. It didn't hurt narrative, but our ways of communicating radically changed. 
suddenly a lot of communication became about not the quality of the paper, not the publisher, but relevance and timeliness. Events and aggregating communities together is going to likewise be reinvented. It is no longer going to be about, oh, we do this annually. Oh, we have a great venue. Oh, wait till you see the menu. It's going to be all about timeliness and relevance and the ability to aggregate people when it matters. Mm -hmm. And that people are going to find is most often done better, more efficiently, with greater relevance and timeliness to people who count online through virtual event platforms like Shindig than by trying to dial back to 2019 and thinking everyone who is important is going to show up at CES. No. Lots of people can't afford the time. Lots of people can't afford, uh, uh, aren't the right uh, point in their career. They don't have the title. They don't have the money. They have kids. And once you get to CES, hey, what do you know? You can't even go to half the meetings you would want to because it's impossible to navigate. That's right. So it's chaos and your time is, you know, not very productive. For lots of things, people are going to find a video chat event that allows for real networking like Shindig does, where you can privately chat at will, and great production like Shindig does, where you can produce really magical experiences. Those kind of things are going to help reinvent the event business and change it the same way that text change. And yeah. we're going to be living, you know, uh, online and, and, and convening and interacting with people on a regular basis we never dreamed would be possible. Yeah. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but networking needs to change, right? Because without as many of these uh, native or spontaneous opportunities to meet people, you know, a lot of the traditional online networking solutions today don't really work. So now that you can bring people together in these virtual spaces and maybe with future technologies like the metaverse, everything else, you can really start to create some of these, you know, organic moments and these uh, opportunistic um, reasons to meet in, in, a, in a virtual sense. Right. I, I mean, I think uh, we're going to it's going to be a wild ride, you know, uh, when um, when we started, as I said, at the beginning of this, you know, virtual no one knew what a virtual event was. Uh, for a lot of people, virtual events are still represented by webinars, which, you know, hey, Nintendo 64 was introduced the same year as the uh, 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 webinar. Uh, mm -hmm. We all were on, uh, uh, on Motorola StarTex the same year that the webinar came out. Uh, Macare the Macarena was a hit when wow. the webinar came out. It Very is time tough. to retire the webinar. <laughs> R.I.P. Yeah. Um, and uh, move to virtual events. But in any event, a lot of people didn't know what it, what it was uh, two years ago. Now it's projected to be an $800 billion vertical wow. with, by 2030. So if you're not hip to how to do a virtual event, how to make it really work and and uh, uh, for you, then uh, please reach out to us at Chindi. Yeah, terrific. Steve, one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who comes on the show uh, is you know if you were going to be building a, a new business in the digital media space today, what would you do, right? And so the impetus behind the question is you've been building Shindig for eleven years now, right? You have a lot of experience as an entrepreneur. What's the white space out there? If you were going to go tackle a new problem, what would it be? Well, first of all, I'd say I think the the white space is we're just tech, and I think there's huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to develop specialties in how to produce and monetize virtual events in each within each vertical. So uh, I think that's, you know, to the extent that is a huge growth sector of the economy, the tech is only one piece of it. Uh, 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 the creativity behind, just like we, you know, creating the entertainment is gonna involve individual producers that have a great entertainment idea. You know, just like, hey, podcasting technology was around for a long time. It took, you know, a couple of brilliant podcasters to really take that technology and make it a format yeah. that really uh, spoke to people. Um, so I think, the, you know, the tech is now there to create these amazing participatory events. Uh, 
the next step is that layering in that whole layer of creativity and entrepreneurship to, to uh, 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 make it sing uh, 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 to different communities. Um, beyond that, um, uh, uh, I think um, uh, well, you know, I'm not sure what I what I'd say. You know, I I, I wake up every day so excited with how rapidly the world is changing and and uh, you know uh, how much we're learning that we didn't know the day before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so uh, I'm inspired. Uh, uh, I would have presumed to know where the uh, 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 where uh, one of your listeners is going to find that, you know some great new idea. But it's going to be you know probably you know I love ideas that are hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. You know when I did TV tunes, it was hiding in plain sight. There had been a thousand records of TV tunes. Uh, I thought all the artists I saw they were all passed over by the majors. Uh, they were out there uh, in a way they were hiding in plain sight. They needed care and love and feeding yeah, to, sure. uh, uh, to hit their audience. But their genuineness and their genius was, was there if you were open to seeing it. Um, uh, I think, don't think that your great idea has to be uh, 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 some kind of advanced algorithm or some new scientific discovery. There are great ideas just sitting there uh, right in front of you. Uh, uh, um, so if you're open to it and, uh, uh, um, you know, and think it. Yeah, absolutely. You can find those ideas in the everyday. They're out there. You just have to be curious and be open to them. Yep. Very good. Steve, where can people find out more about you and more about Shindig? Uh, I'm Steve at Shindig.com. I'm available and I'm on the web. And, and uh, uh, if someone should want to check out the future of virtual events, check out a demo of uh, uh, you can sign up for at Shindig.com. Fantastic. Uh, well, Steve, this has been so much fun. Thank you uh, to Tom, who put us in touch. And, and thank you for taking the time today to uh, share your story and, and, you know, explore some of these interesting themes about how online uh, communities have evolved, how the music industry has changed over the last several decades, and now what the future of virtual events looks like, given all this amazing technology at our fingertips. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, James. And thanks to all of you on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm James Creech, and this has been another edition of All Things Video. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll share and subscribe for new episodes. See you next time.